And then we have another 40 hours of doing sort of behind the scenes sleep is when we're, um, you know, doing all the behind the scenes. That's the very rough outline of what I do. What would you all like to know? Well, let's start maybe with I don't want to put the pressure on that. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to actually get off this. I thought it was turn off the sound. But, um, I'd like to start with your story. You want to share your background and, and how you got to be doing this from living in a van? Yeah, yeah totally, totally. <laughs> As a band member, not down uh, by the river. Right, I'll <laughs> both of those in some, in some way. But um, yeah, it was a really unexpected path, I think, 20 years ago now, which is about when I started my uh, adult life, I suppose. Um, uh, I, I, a position like this wouldn't have existed anywhere, um, and I certainly would have never dreamt that I would wind up doing something like this, which is part of the fun of this uh, crazy, ever-proliferating uh, creative economy, is that as new information and knowledge and creativity gets synthesized in different ways, different structures pop up to sort of support and enable that, and um, for all of us, collectively, who are kind of in those fields, I think that means that there's always going to be new stuff going on. Um, so I think, like, uh, you know, for the purposes of this job, anyway, I, I took a few other winding detours along the way. But um, for this one, uh, in retrospect, there's kind of three different projects that I worked on that um, brought me to where I am now. Um, one of them was a, a small nonprofit that friends and I started. When I was going to college in Iowa City, the University of Iowa, Iowa City is a place not like Fort Collins, uh, with a few less mountains, but otherwise pretty similar. Mm -hmm. And a uh, great university, had an amazing experience there. And um, some friends and I started a small uh, nonprofit called the James Gang. Uh, at the time, we called it a community networking organization. Um, again, yeah, with the sort of benefit of hindsight, it's what we could do. Yeah, this one. I thought he was helping me. Hello? Oh, hey, Carly. Hey, Carly. Could you turn your microphone off? <laughs> so sorry. That's no, okay. Good. It's all good. We're glad you're here. Yeah, good to hear you. Um, so with the benefit of hindsight, I think we would call what we did with the James Gang sort of a creative placemaking organization, but that term may have existed, but it certainly was not uh well known enough that we would ever use it as a bunch of scrappy 17, 18, 19 year old kids. Um, so we kind of started this organization that tied artists together with local business owners, together with the university, um, together with actually some philanthropists too. I don't usually think about that part of it, but that is also somewhat relevant to my current situation. Um, and we basically put on all kinds of different events and happenings that would bring these different sectors of the community together to benefit the larger whole in some way. Um, one example that I like to use um, is we started a thing called the 10,000 Hours Show, where we would, with the Student Activities Board, we would pick, uh, book a huge headliner um, every year, and the only way that you could get to see this headliner, so that so first year we did it, the headliner was Ben Folds, oh, wow. which in, uh, 1999, Ben Folds was all the rage, mm -hmm. and that is again now, kind of. <laughs> um, so me and Ben are like traveling a similar trajectory. <laughs> um, but uh, the only way you could see this show, you couldn't pay for a ticket, you could only do 10 hours of community service. Um, and so we went around the community and signed up 180 different organizations, and it was everything from Organizations that work with homelessness or education or mental health or, you know, sort of the, the, the usual um, nonprofit world um, kind of landscape. And we thought we called it the 10,000 hour show because we thought optimistically we could get a thousand students and community to do 10 hours of community service each. And even in the first year, um, uh, just by virtue of it being a, a, a thing that I think it unlocked, I don't know what it unlocked, there was some, there was some magic combo there where we got 38,000 hours uh, of community service done by, by more like uh, 3,200 people as opposed to 1,000. So um, that was really fun. That taught us all kinds of lessons. We did other stuff. We put on music festivals. We um, started a, a thing called Public Space One, which was an actual physical hub, which again, in some ways, 
That's true. Um, through all this work, I um, uh, again, there were detours in between that I'm eliminating to <laughs> the Jersey Shore and the Copenhagen <laughs> and the Netherlands mostly, and Mexico. But uh, uh, I ended up a, a, a while later crossing the path of Richard Florida, who's a good friend of Michael's. And uh, this is Michael Seaman over here, who is uh, imaginarily speaking to. Uh, CSU All-Star, Michael Seaman. That's right. <laughs> um, and um, I ran into uh, Rich because um, they asked me and him to sit on a panel together sort of to talk about the, this work that the James Gang had done. Um, it had uh, just maybe just because of the innovative nature of the partnerships, I think, had attracted some attention from local government, state government, et cetera. Um, so they asked us to come to Des Moines, to the big city from <laughs> Iowa City, and uh, talk about that. Um, Richard was on the panel. We hit it off. He was, at the time, in the midst of his rise of the creative class, uh, that star sort of rising a bit. And um, I ended up, again, skip a few other detours a couple years later, um, got a call from him, from his team, and said, hey, do you want to come write with us? Because I had written a newspaper article in college for a local paper um, that he and his team had seen, and they liked it. And I think part of the reason they liked it is that it wasn't all um, agreement or, or flattery, which maybe he was mostly used to at that time. <laughs> um, and they wanted, um, and I think it's a good like sort of work-life lesson that, you know, being honest and telling people where you do actually disagree with them um, can be a huge benefit, at least in that situation. Um, and so they asked me to kind of come and be Rich's devil's advocate and do work on speech writing and research and book writing, article writing. So that was really fascinating a few years. We um, traveled around the world. We did consultations with all different size um, communities around the creative economy, around um, projects and organizations that you know, we would do everything from uh, visit uh, Americans for the Arts to talk with a very conservative CEO or governor of some Midwestern state to talk with some crazy radical progressive European uh, alliance of whatever they were coming up with at the time. Um, so it was a really, it was a fun job in the sense that it got us into a lot of um, corners of society across the political spectrum, across the economic spectrum the cultural spectrum um, and I really got to see a lot of the similarities and differences of all these places across the world um, trying to do this creative economy work which by and large most of them are still trying to do or are just now catching on that they want to do it or, or some permutation of that so I'm happy to talk about that later um, from from the world of Richard Florida I um, Decided that I had it way too easy and that I wanted to go um, sleep on people's floors and live in a van down by the river for <laughs> really for the next 10 years of my life. So I started, so I started a rock and roll band, uh, which I was, uh, I did full time for about a decade and that was another just amazing, got to, if I thought I got to see a lot of nooks and crannies of the world with Richard Florida, that was a whole another level of getting to see. Um, kind of the most glorious and the most mundane and, and the most impoverished uh, parts of American life. We toured everywhere in the States, everywhere in Canada, uh, across most of um, Europe, and uh, really got a look at communities from a whole another lens, which was essentially the sort of nighttime economy lens, I guess you would call it now in official terms, <laughs> in retrospect. Um, <laughs> But um, all of that got a bit exhausting, of course, as rock and roll life does. And so I moved out to Colorado eight years ago now, uh, seven and a half years ago, uh, attempting originally to get away from music as far as possible. I thought I was going to go read uh, books in the mountains and um, hike around and have campfires and things like that that people do in Colorado all the time. <laughs> I rarely get a chance to do that now because I... Uh, uh, got signed up uh, with a very good friend of mine who's also in Fort Collins now, but we were living in Denver at the time. Me and Bryce Merrill um, got to work on researching and writing the city of Denver's music strategy, um, so sort of the municipal government lens on how to support 
the music industry in Denver, um, and then we got to work on the state of Colorado's music strategy, so how do we do the same thing, but at a statewide level, which introduces a whole other set of variables when you talk about um, the politics and economics of a state that encompasses um, a much wider array of humanity and of economic conditions than, than just a city, than just a metropolitan area does. Um, and Colorado still to this day is one of the only um, states that has a statewide music strategy because it's not an easy or fun or intuitive thing to do. I shouldn't say that. It's a super fun thing to do because you get to see, again, all nooks and crannies of society and of real life. Um, but it's not easy. Uh, but we made a good time of it. And then Bohemian Foundation, skip forward a couple years, um, got a hold of me and uh, Bryce's uh, work on those two music strategies and some other stuff that we'd done and uh, basically said, hey, would you like to come up and um, talk about this thing we're putting together called Music District, Fort Collins, and uh, I had great memories from Fort Collins from touring through here, you know, a decade or more ago, maybe 12 years ago at this point, um, and the first place that I ever stopped, I always forget this part of the story, but the first place I ever stopped was uh, a little radio station called KRFC, which um, for those of you who know the Music District, you will know that KRFC was then and is still now a uh, Habitant of that little block that we have. So I stopped by KRFC, did a radio show with my bandmates, asked where we could get good coffee. They sent us across <laughs> the alley to the Alley Cat, um, which again to this day is a favorite institution of mine in Collins. Um, so Bryce and I started coming up here uh, five years ago now, 2015, and talking with uh, Bohemian Foundation about how to put together this thing they were calling a music district and our particular interest in it. Um, and sort of what we brought to the table was uh, community engagement. We really wanted to understand if we were gonna do this work, if we were gonna help this organization, um, you know, put this kind of large object thing, place, uh, collection of people into the middle of a, what was obviously already a really vibrant music scene how could we do that? How could we help them do that in a way that was responsible and um, kind of took account of all the things that are existed? Venues, recording studios, etc. So Bryce and I spent about a year doing community engagement, which just meant talking with everyone and anyone who would uh, put up with us. Um, usually we bribed them with coffee or beer or uh, food so that they would put up with us for at least uh, an hour or so. And many of those conversations went on for hours and hours, and they were really inspiring. And we, with that input, kind of said to Bohemian, okay, here's, basically gave them a white paper, said here's what we think the music district could or should be, what do you think? Um, they then hired, uh, at the time, their new chief music officer, another friend of all of ours named Tom Sheriff. And Tom um, ended up, we skip a lot of steps here, but he ended up hiring uh, me and Bryce full time uh, a few months later to actually move up here and um, become residents of the community, and again help put together the music district. So I think that I think that brings us up to speed more or less. Is that too much detail? No, it's we great. Edit, edit, edit out no, no, not at all. <laughs> um, I, for those of you who are not in Fort Collins, which is our online family. Maybe you could explain the Bohemian Foundation briefly, just kind of share with them. We, it's very unique here in Fort yeah. Collins, what we have to offer. Yeah, it is. The Bohemian Foundation is, is actually, I've come to find a pretty unique entity, period, but especially in this neck of the woods. Um, it's a private family foundation that has four program areas. They invest lots of uh, love and people and money and resources, real estate, et cetera, in these four different areas. Um, global programs, um, civic programs, community programs, and music programs. For any of you who know the foundation or the private family foundation world, you'll know global, civic, and community are sort of usual players in that. Um, fortunately, they're very usual players in it because they work on all kinds of really important stuff, um, health, care and the environment and poverty and homelessness and education and, you know, uh, democratic institutions, etc. cetera. Um, music programs is kind of the weird stepsister of the other three. There's um, very few foundations that are 
um, investing specifically in uh, modern, contemporary, popular music, whatever you want to call it. There's a lot of different names for it. Uh, but basically music that is outside of the symphony, opera, ballet crowd, which is what family foundations or foundations period would have maybe traditionally invested in um, starting long, long ago. Uh, but we at Bohemian invest, really focus on, on contemporary, popular, modern music, hip hop, rock and roll, EDM, mariachi, I mean, really whatever people are interested in, that's what we're interested in. So is that enough context? Yeah, that's or is, perfect. Okay, yeah. Sometimes I'm too deep down into the rabbit hole to know. Oh, you mean? Yeah, to yeah. know what is, what is uh, known and yeah. what is not. Yeah. I have a question for you. Sarah, yes. On behalf of our students, I hear the word creative economies passed around a lot. And I know it sort of intuitively makes sense, but can you talk a little bit more broadly about what that is or what it's becoming? I feel like I should focus. I feel like I should focus on this one. I mean, I can talk about creative economy all day long, but you guys also have a, a, a world-renowned expert uh, right here. Michael Seaman, should I, should I give you a ring on this one? <laughs> Just so they don't have to hear my voice droning on for like, you know, an hour and a half. We'll mix it up a little bit. Uh, it's it's a collection. I'll, I'll correct you. The collection of firms and individuals uh, use creative process uh, or somehow add value to uh, other industries in a creative way um, to create um, uh, value add. So your products, events, uh, be a graphic designer that has its own graphic design firm, or work for an art direction, or a, I should say an advertising firm, or you could be a graphic designer that works for an airline, but you're still part of that creative economy. Uh, and a lot of it is that uh, you have the super concentrated creative core, which is people that are fine artists and musicians and actors and have uh, things like plays, concerts, festivals, but you also have things on the, the, are a little bit more on the Say less thought of side uh, in terms of like food, like uh, craft beer. It's a great creative economy staple in Fort Collins. Uh, and that's also, if you start then peeling back, you look, well, there's graphic designers that work for uh, uh, craft beverage places. There's also people that are driving trucks, delivering the beer, and that's part of the creative economy, but they're not necessarily creatives. Uh, but in a way, everyone is creative. That, that's really the tenet of at any economy, the successful ones are creative to some capacity. Definitely, definitely. That was a very successful phone a friend. Um, yep, that's very good. I, I, I well would played. just add to that a couple things for context. You know, one is that um, Michael didn't say it directly, but he alluded to it that you know, in the past, essentially, the value that was created in economies was generally done so by physical products initially by agriculture and then sort of the majority of it came from something like manufacturing um, using raw materials basically and at, you know depending on, on where you start counting in the 70s 80s etc uh, it started to transition a little bit more to what people call the knowledge economy or education economy Some folks are maybe more that term as it relates to technology, to computing, to stuff that has less to do with the physical resources, the intangible uh, mental components, if you will. And then um, from there, um, in a sense, uh, Richard and Michael and other folks just kind of recontextualized because the knowledge economy and the information economy, those didn't quite get at everything that was going on. That's when the idea of the creative economy and therefore the creative class um, came along. I think another super interesting point that that uh, Michael alluded to there was that um, creativity exists in every profession, and and in fact, a large part of the the kind of charge of the creative economy, although many people missed it, was to the owners of companies and the heads of state and the people sort of in charge to figure out ways to more effectively have the creativity of everybody in any industry because um, a lot of richer Florida stuff actually came from the from his background in the Japanese manufacturing system which was completely based in a 
physical raw materials economy context, but they had figured out how to sort of tap the creativity of every day of shop floor workers to sort of make all the processes better. So that's a form of creativity. It doesn't have to just be the obvious things. It can be what are the little tweaks in a gigantic, you know, Ford factory or whatever it may be, the equivalent of that, um, that can make the whole thing run more smoothly, that can make it safer, that can make it just better in, a, in every sense. And so I think that was certainly one of his inspirations was from that manufacturing system and, and the management system, I should say, that went along with that, that again, allowed the sort of creativity of everybody to find a home with the organization. Any follow-up questions? I do. Yeah, okay. Oh, um, again, on sort of on behalf of our students. So I'm a graduate student in the LEAP program, and I see where you've gone, and it's like, what can I do in my community or who do I talk to, or how do I get things going to sort of make things happen the way they're happening here, or in other communities? Yeah, well, if you're a graduate student, then you already surpassed me in terms <laughs> of education, because I never quite made it there. I may still someday, uh, I think about it often, because I really love academia, but I, after my undergrad, I ended up somehow strangely finding different ways to work within academia without ever going back to school proper, although I would say one thing that grad programs and really good undergrad programs teach you is just how to constantly learn and how to have a sort of continual improvement process in the Japanese manufacturing lingo with everyday life. And I think that um, the most profound or most interesting things have happened for me in life when I really just looked very directly at what my current situation was personal level or professionally or in the community that I was embedded in and just said like what's here what's fun what am I passionate about who are the who especially are the people that I can sort of um, get on the team or whose team do I want to join who am, wh what am I excited to do where I can really um, multiply that leverage I'm just a big believer going back to sort of the, the theme maybe of this evening I'm a big believer in teams. Uh, I think it's you know the classic proverb that everybody um, likes to quote: "If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together." Um, I think that's very true, and I say that as a very impatient person who, at many times in my life, has wanted only to go fast into something, and uh, that's where a lot of my failures and learnings have come from: is uh, in realizing, oh, this could actually be better and more fun if I was invested in or embedded in some larger context, whether it's an organization, a community, um, and these can be formal or informal. So that's a really generic answer, but I think, it, I think that's the level of abstraction that makes it make sense to anywhere, right? Like I would have specific advice or ideas for someone of how they want to get involved or build their thing or their team or their product in Fort Collins versus in. Iowa City or in Washington DC where I lived for, for a very long time which is a very different place than here but um, I would say as a, as a general principle you know you got to find something you love and I will just say that over and over and over again because it can't you can't repeat it often enough um, and I think you got to find other people who feel equally passionately but hopefully who are different from you also who complementary um, diverse skill sets and backgrounds and mindsets would there be any way to turn up the volume in what you're saying? I'm so sure. sorry. That's great. No. Do you mean that figuratively? Like I can start <laughs> saying more interesting <laughs> things? Or... No, just turn up the mic. No. Oh, yeah. We'll just move that closer. I know, I know how to work a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> fairly. I just so can't so hear. Yeah, I heard you very well at the beginning, but I can't hear very well right now. Huh. I don't know what's changed. Um, but uh, has, but are, is it still not great at the moment? Because I'm much closer to the microphone now. I wonder if it's actually, it must be because I'm too because the light's on. But I wonder if the input is actually. Oh, Carly, is that any better? Bad. Well, that means it's on. No, <laughs> not really. Oh. It's not. How strange. Is it the microphone? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm going to fiddle our way in right there. Is that any better, Carly? A little bit. Check, check. 
Testing, microphone check. I spent like 10 years of my life doing this. <laughs> <laughs> One, two. <laughs> hmm. I wonder if the input is actually set to. Oh, yeah, let's see. Here. Audio on. I don't know this system, but I'm going to try and get clever with it real quick. Uh, blue jeans, about had. I'm going to give you guys a tech seminar now on how to uh, bumble your way through. I'm looking for preferences. I'm not seeing them. So I'm going to trust that this thing is actually on the microphone. Here, let's try this. Oh, yeah, there you go. Settings. Michelle Stanley, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, you click, uh, on, uh, click uh. on blue somewhere. That's what it was on anyway. It okay, said automatic. Carly. But how does that sound, Carly? Okay. I <laughs> No different, but I will. I will just. Um, I'll try and put it on a outside speaker or something. Well, we could do built-in microphone if it's not working. Okay, we're gonna try no, one I'll just more get near the here. computer. How do you feel about this? How does this oh. sound? Hello. Uh, Hello. Michelle sounded great. Yeah, that's because she's very close to the <laughs> to the uh, oh, input yeah. source here. Now I'm gonna crowd. <laughs> Now I'm going to crowd you all and try to uh, yell directly into your faces. Is that better? Uh, a little, yeah. A little, okay. <laughs> we'll take a little. Why not? Um, so I actually, can I do a follow-up? Yes. I'm going to do a follow-up. So I'm thinking about the team part of your talk. And I, so many times with our students I hear, they have these great ideas and they're really passionate about it. They've got this... You know, I'm really, you know, pumped about, I don't know, education and dance or education and music or I, I really want to start my own nonprofit with this. And, and they, they have the kernel and they don't have the team. Mm -hmm. And they're almost, our students almost go it alone a little bit and then we, we graduate them and spit them out and they're out on the sidewalk trying to figure out how to make these dreams happen. And I'm thinking about the James gang mm -hmm. and I'm thinking about all these other cool things you did. And, and I'm wondering in a very practical sense, how did these things come about and how did you, how were you able to assemble your group? Cool. That's a good one. Um, well, I, I think the first thing to think about in any context, uh, it, uh, let me put it this way. At this point in my life, when I have an idea that I love, the first thing I do is Google it to see who else has had that idea in the universe because statistically speaking, probably 35,000 other people have had it in one, one form or another. And I think one thing that I've become a big fan of is not reinventing the wheel. So not always thinking it has to be my team or whoever's team sort of came up with the idea. But instead, sort of getting a lay of the land and seeing, and, and by that I mean literally the inner, the global landscape of, of an idea or of an organization, there's always someone out there who exists who's doing it. And depending on what level they're sort of doing it at, um, you, you can almost always just reach out to them and either they will be toiling away by themselves on this idea that they've had somewhere halfway across the planet or sometimes they've had just down the street from where you're sitting right now. Um, that always makes the logistics a little bit easier. Um, but you can always sort of offer your services or your excitement to other people doing stuff. Um, I think that's a really, that's the quickest way to get plugged into momentum or into uh, multiple people. I think if you uh, come across an idea that is truly unique or, or at least it has some kind of physical geographical limitation to it as our organization, the James Gang, would have. It's not that it was a unique idea, it's just that we wanted to do it right where we were. So it was very geographically specific. And we actually did spend quite a bit of time kind of looking around to see who was doing what and, and sort of slowly building a coalition of folks um, who said, Okay, we don't totally understand what this kernel is that you're talking about just yet, but we're we're, we're willing to go with it. Um, I think the way you get people to, to go with it is number one, going back to that being passionate and loving what you do, because that is um, often contagious. Um, but then number two, really just creating spaces that are fun to be in, and in the in the and I mean space in both the physical and metaphorical 
sense. But in our case, we had an actual house that we lived in that was like the James Gang house, and that's what it came to be known as. And so we would just throw potlucks like every weekend or every couple weeks as often as we could and just invite people over and more and more people would come and it's always a, a sort of rocky road and slow and steady and spiky and goes off on detours and whatnot. Um, and people come and they're not excited about it and you're like, oops, that was kind of a misfire, but like, you know, uh, no real loss on anybody's part. They got to have some good soup or pizza or whatever with you. Uh, or beer maybe, and then and then move on and 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 even some of those people who we connected with early on and then moved on to do their own things. Some of those are still the people that I keep in touch with and whose ideas I love the most. They just didn't gel at that particular moment. Um, but I think just like creating that community around an idea or around a company or a nonprofit or a product or whatever it is, it really maybe it doesn't need to feel like this, but for me it's always been better if it feels like you are entering the universe of Michael Seaman and everything that he is thinking or doing. And that's like its own, own kind of like unique little fun thing to be around because at the end of the day, even if you, one of the many smart things that I learned from Richard in Florida was that even if you're paying people a whole bunch of money in the sort of creative economy, you have to treat them like volunteers because people have, at the end of the day, lots of options. Some people have infinite options, some people only have a few, but regardless, people have options. And if life around you or your idea or your product or your company or your nonprofit or whatever it is isn't fun to be around, and I don't mean fun in a shallow way, I mean if it isn't meaningful, if it doesn't bring joy, if there isn't some kind of overriding mission to it. Like there's a lot of different flavors of what fun or what happiness is, but there's got to be some component to that that's not just the material, just the paycheck, just the profit margin, et cetera, at the end of the day. Um, did I answer that question yes, at all? Yes, you did. Okay. Actually, it's, <laughs> it's connecting me to the next thing. Sorry, we have a, it's the middle school outreach ensemble. Oh, cool. Right? So, Let's invite him in. It's actually very, very cool. We, the music department has this incredible, like, um, it's a spring thing only where they bring in all these middle school students from across the city. Awesome. And our student educators learn how to teach hands on. So that's why it's a little active outside for us, cool. but you guys I can't like really it. hear that. It's like a rock and roll. Club. It's exactly what it is, yeah. Uh, so thinking about the team stuff again, so you've talked about how to bring people into the fold. I would imagine, well, I mean, we all know that teams have personalities. Yeah. And I wonder some of the strengths and weaknesses of that or the pitfalls of pros and cons, um, how you've navigated that. Because you've certainly been on, in, on a team that has functioned really well, super high functioning, and ones that maybe filtered out. You know, there, there are issues and you know, maybe you can talk about how to navigate that and maybe what it looks like from the inside. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of different directions to go from there. Um, um, well, first of all, I don't think any team is ever, I have never known of a team that is that is actually truly super high functioning in, in the sense of like, everyone's amazing, everyone's on their game all the time, nonstop bells and whistles and meaningful inspiration and da da da. I just don't think that's how human beings are. Uh, and so, you know, again, just by the law of statistics, it, teams can't be that way either. Um, I think teams are tough and I think that, or, or, or I should say they are occasionally tough and you have to get through those tough times to um, enjoy and revel in and take advantage of the really good times and the really inspiring times. So. In that sense, not unlike any kind of relationship, whether a marriage or a friendship or whatever. Um, I think that um, although it was far from super high functioning, I think that being in a, in a touring rock and roll band for 10 years was, a, was multiple, was like seven decades worth of personality and human resources and psycholo psychology training. <laughs> Uh, all rolled into one, including my own. I, I think that one of the things you have to know as a member of a team is that anytime you're looking at the rest of your team and you're, why isn't this going like that? Or how come this person's not doing that? 
ch chances are pretty good that they're looking at you and feeling the same thing about something that you're doing. It, it that that took me a, maybe longer to learn than, than I wish it would have. Um, but it's a really handy thing to keep in mind because at the end of the day, the only person that you can truly, truly, truly have some small shred of of control over, and I don't really even believe in that idea, is yourself. And I think even with yourself, it's hard. Um, there are some. There's just a lot of factors about the world that we all uh, have have uh, grown up in and had all of our histories and our traumas and our baggages and our really positive experiences. It shapes how we all operate on a day to day basis. And so I think the biggest thing. It's just time, and some people call that patience, and some people call it tolerance, and I think all of those things are related, but I, I think by and large, teams that I've been a part of, that I've been really lucky to be a part of, have always gotten better with time. And, and, and if, again, it's like a relationship where there's the honeymoon period where everything is awesome, and you feel like you're on fire and you're on top of the world and then there's a bit of a drop off when that wears off and that's a natural side effect of how we're wired as human beings evolutionarily. Um, and if you can get through that, I think then you get to the longer lasting, truer, deeper stuff out of which come better ideas and more interesting products and more interesting companies, et cetera. Um, is that a, is that getting great. too much into relationship advice? And not, <laughs> I mean, that, that's, that's what a team is, no. I think is like, and, and, and as someone who grew up in a very, like a very academically driven, very competitive, very, I would say in some ways robotic and not good or bad. This is not my family. This is the school system. My family is actually the opposite of this, but the school system that I was a part of, which I was, which I really loved and which I feel really grateful for, was a public school system that was kind of down on its luck, and that, um, as a result, felt like it had to like really lay into like work, 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 work. It was like the classic ni '90s mentality of you can do anything in the world you want to do. All you have to do is work a hundred hours a week make it happen like it's just that easy and that has some drawbacks <laughs> and I think it leaves people's personalities and intricacies and idiosyncrasies uh, out of the um, equation and I think you very much have to factor that stuff back in especially as teams grow or scale or whatever whatever you want to call it um, those things multiply along with the potential to do good work so sort of the negative externalities in some economic sense multiply along with the positive externalities and you just got to keep paying attention to those and that and that can be hard for someone like me that's hard because I, I had to learn that much later in life um, but it pays off again if you want to if you want to go far go together Great. so I that thing on that Hi. We're going to try and get as close <laughs> as possible there because we're cutting this you, the mic now. Can you hear me okay? Car anyway. Carly, we're depending on you for uh... <laughs> So anyway, um, a lot of our students are online students. And I think they create community when they come here and do their courses. But I, I really like what you were saying about Googling other people and, you know, is, are you seeing that you can create teams or community with what you're doing sort of globally or, or nationally? And how would you recommend people doing that? Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I have worked on a couple sort of remote teams or global teams or whatever, whatever you want to call it, virtual teams, um, always with real people, just to be clear. They were not virtual avatars that I was working with, <laughs> although that'll be cool when you get to do that. Um, it, uh, again, it, it's, it's all the same factors, it's just multiplied in terms of, I feel like all the benefits and drawbacks of human beings are exacerbated when things go mostly virtual or mostly global. It, there, there becomes more potential in some sense, because if you, depending on what industry or what field or whatever you're in, 
um, if you can have more of those interconnected networks with a team. If we had 16 people spread all across the world, we could do different things than we do now with 16 people in Fort Collins, right? Um, but also the, the potential for disconnect is much larger as well. And so I think you have to, again, get really good at sort of checking in and understanding where people are coming from. Um, or find a bunch of people who are very robotic and very automatic and very disciplined in their thinking. There are a few of those out there. Um, I've worked with some of them and they're awesome. Uh, but I think it's not a realistic, it's not a realistic thing, especially from afar, to think that people are going to fall exactly in line with where you want them in the organization or in the production line or in the overall ecosystem of what you're creating. Uh, yeah. Uh, let's throw, let's throw <laughs> down there. We're flipping around. There you go. <laughs> um, going back to the community outreach, um, you had said uh, trying to convince the community that what you're trying to do is something that they need. What I you... didn't say that actually, but I, but I can clarify that if, okay. I, if I made it sound like that. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, maybe not not what they need, but how it like benefits them. But uh, my question is kind of that you always run into those sort of curmudgeonly people, how do you, uh, is it's like something that's a valid concern, do you address that and then hopefully that fixes the issue or do you just butt heads with them and say like, well, like 90% of the people think it's okay and you're in the 10% that don't or like how do you address those? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm really glad you asked that question, uh, Zach, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, because it, it makes me realize that I didn't really clarify what I meant or what we went through in terms of community engagement. Because as you point out, there are different ways of doing it. Um, one is the sort of push model, and one is the, the, the sort of pull model or the, the, the intake model. Um, there's other permutations too, but I think in very blunt terms, those would be like two archetypes to look at. Uh, we didn't go around trying to convince people that they needed a music district or um, or even that it would be good for them or even anything like that. Uh, but that is something that a lot of companies, a lot of organizations do. In some fields, for some context, that's appropriate. That makes sense. You, you can sort of raise people's consciousness, hopefully, or in some cases lower people's consciousness, <laughs> by convincing them that there is this new better thing that they need and they try it out and their life gets better sure enough or maybe sometimes their life gets worse um, and you've done your job. That's not the model that we use at all um, because the ecosystem of music is so complex what we did was really 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 start from a purely listening perspective. I mean you have to know the questions to ask, you have to know sort of what your market research or what your focus group or whatever you want to call it what the universe of that stuff is, but then you really actually have to listen and adapt to that. So we did, and, and I think I think even more and more for-profit companies, or I should say even more and more non-profits, for-profit companies that has actually done a better job of this for longer probably, because in the non-profit world, we tend to think like, we've got a brilliant solution, this is good for everyone, we're gonna push it and push it and push it, and then two years in, we were like, I don't get it. How come nobody's showing up for whatever? Like, isn't this a good thing? And the answer is probably yes, but it's probably good or not. It's good in a different way than you understand, or it needs to be tweaked ever so slightly in this direction or that direction. And that's this whole you know, idea from the world of entrepreneurship of, of pivoting and of doing just constant market research and trying to understand what people actually want and need by listening to what they're telling you instead of by trying to sort of push your message or your product to them. So we did much more of the sort of intake, listening, listening, listening. That's what I mean when I say community engagement. Um, for the music district, um, it's interesting because in a sense like the uh, a rock and roll band, for instance, is the opposite model. Like you are you don't do a lot of market research when you're writing a song. Like you pretty much write the song that you and your friends want to write 
and then you push it out to the world over and over again. And if what you're doing is good enough, then people think, man, I really needed that song in my life. I'm going to put it on repeat and find playlists around it and da da da. Um, and if they don't, then then you know you become um, sort of part of the infinite white noise in in the music world. So I, I actually think again that experience taught me a lot about how people interact as producers, consumers, as performers, audiences, and hopefully how they get beyond any of those dichotomies and just say like we're actually all just a part of this thing. What's the best way that we can co-create something together that's actually meaningful for everyone? It doesn't just feel like you're trying to sell them a song or you're trying to sell them a new product or you're trying to sell them a mission-driven cause. Even if it's a great cause, maybe it's not exactly what they want. Um, is that, does that clarify it a little bit? You had a second yeah. part to that question, too, that I can't remember now. Uh, overcoming, like... The yeah, awesome that's right. Level. That's right. The, so, so like, the, the grumps or the naysayers or whatever, I think you already answered the question, which is there, there's multiple approaches you can take, and usually it's a mix of them. Um, there are certainly people, even in this community, who, who have not thought what we're doing is the greatest thing from the beginning. Some of those people we've sort of won over with time, and, again, some of that just kind of goes back to sort of, like, patience and just continually... Talking with someone, I think it also has to come from a place of genuine humility. Like, I can't assume, let alone act, like the music district is what everybody needs. for their. It's, it's their one-stop shop for the answers to the rest of their life. It's usually not. Like, usually people come to the, I would say the majority of people come to the music district, we actually point them in other directions, whether it's a recording studio or a PR person or a contact in Nashville that they really need to go meet or whatever it may be. Like we think of ourselves a little bit more as a switchboard. And I think in that way, we're lucky that we, that we get to do that um, because we don't have to sell anything in a sense. Um, I think it, with that orientation, it becomes relatively easy to win people over with time. Um, and also because like, you don't, really care if they get one over because the, you're not like that's not the purpose of it is to have you know the highest uh, amount of customers you possibly can or whatever it may be um, and I think there's some some things where you just have to say like 100% of human beings never agree on anything that's okay like and and if um, you know if you all know the sort of long tail uh, uh, analogy or concept in economics a lot of people in the creative economy have sort of gone back to serving very niche markets where, you know, maybe 1% of the population is actually interested in what they're doing, but that's a really important percent. And what you focus on, one of the principles that I really like also is don't focus on how you're not serving a certain segment of the population. Focus on how you are serving the population that's there, that loves what you do, and just keep making that better and sort of grow that, grow wh whatever it means to grow it from there conceptually. Do that slowly but surely so that you really focus on the people who already love you and make things better and better for them, whether it's a product or an organization or whatever. And as you slowly expand outward, rather than trying to go for this like far outlier who absolutely hates everything you do, who cares? Like, it's okay. You don't have to be everybody's best friend. Um, focus on those folks and, and ask them the questions about what is it that you like about this? Instead of obsessing over, which is the natural human tendency to do, is to obsess over how come I can't, how come this person is such an outlier in my life? Like, you focus on the things that you can't control or that you don't understand. Um, instead, sort of focus on, like, what do you like about what we do? Like, how is this helping? and keep growing those services or those products. Those are a few different approaches that I think you can sort of use and with equal whatever parts make sense. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I another question. It's a good professorial look over there. Dr. Seaman. <laughs> it strikes me that you've been a part of Bohemian Foundation, which is funded, pretty well funded, mm -hmm. and then you had a grassroots thing with James King. And I, I mean, the self-funding one that you're in now is probably explains itself, but 
for those of our students who are interested in starting something from scratch with no dollars, I'm thinking about, you got Ben Folds to come and do a gig on community and volunteerism. That's really interesting. And I guess I just on a practical side, I think our students might like to know a little bit more about uh, how you were able to do that, make it happen um, from the shoestring side. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's an awesome question. It's it's actually interesting that you picked out the Ben Folds example because that perfectly illustrates what my response was going to be, which is that the only thing less funded than a small uh, nonprofit organization that you're just starting up is a rock and roll band. So I feel, <laughs> I, I feel like I actually learned a lot more lessons about oh, how like shoestring funny. budgets and grassroots and DIY and real like literally bootstrapping from that context than I did from the nonprofit context because mm -hmm. for instance how do we get Ben Folds we knew the people who worked at the student activities board the student activities board actually does have a lot of yes, funding <laughs> um, so we were able to uh, it's it still is bootstrapping in some sense because you yourself don't have the dollars and what you do in that scenario is you find people who are genuinely mission aligned and again instead of trying to sell them a product or say we have this amazing idea you pitch it more as like we have this common interest that we're going towards would you like to see students more engaged with this concert series so so in that case they had a concert series that not enough people showed up for it to make it worthwhile and actually I think that's the case with a lot of um, university activities, departments, et cetera, because often they are legacy or pet projects of some particular time period. Um, and they have, um, you know, through no fault of their own, sort of lost the connection to a larger student body. We got to come to those kind of folks and say, we actually have a great connection, like a very genuine grassroots connection with a whole lot of students. Do you want 4,000 people showing up for this thing that you're doing? in a very celebratory way that will be like this big mission driven thing that will get a lot of press uh, and the obvious answer for them was yes that's very much in our self interest and um, so you know you trade things off you, you find those areas of mutual benefit um, it's a lot harder with a with a rock and roll band or with any I would say like expand the metaphor to any truly inwardly created product or service or whatever, let's just say passion project, like a passion project where you're like, this is what I want to do. And I need to figure out a way to, in a sense, sell the world on this song or this idea or whatever it is. Um, and again, it, it, it kind of goes back to that thing, a, a whole lot of lessons that I wish I would have learned a lot earlier in my rock and roll life because I wouldn't have slept on quite so many floors <laughs> as I did. Although sleeping on the floor is, is part of the fun, and that's part of the community building. And I think we, I was really lucky to find a group of individuals who in some sense were mission aligned and said, what we want to do is go out and play as many shows as we possibly can. We don't care about money, at least in the beginning, and at least to the extent that like, if, if we can survive, that's enough, that's okay. Um, and we really love people. And we're happy to talk with them until four in the morning. And uh, we really love the energy of being on a stage. And I think all of that stuff, more so than the actual product or service that we were selling, is what created community around our band. That's how you get people on board. Um, there's a, you know, there's another concept in the music world that I, I actually kind of wonder if it would be applicable in in the kind of nonprofit or mission driven world. Um, I, do you have a sense of like how many students here are going to go into like very roughly like for profit versus nonprofit versus governmental versus? I'm not sure they could tell what, you. What What are you doing, Zach? Or what do you want to do? Uh, my thing is that I want to try and set up some sort of um, uh, interdisciplinary system and back in California similar to what you said Colorado does for supporting musicians but at the like public education levels middle and high school cool more funding that way kind of very like, cool um, see how good these students are when they have lessons and why you should pay for people to come and teach them on their instrument how they get better that sort of thing 
and do like and so specifically focused around music, or you said interdisciplinary, people, like going to art and music and film. And yeah, super cool, super cool. Um, what I was gonna say, which is not applicable to your case, I, 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 I don't think, but um, but I was just kind of curious for uh, some lay of the land. Um, is that there's this you know 1,000 true fans kind of model or 10,000 true fans depending on the, the math which is that again you focus on a very niche audience and on super serving them as opposed to worrying about um, getting bigger and bigger audiences. Um, that's not what we did. We we were very much like buckshot like let's go every direction we possibly can at once. Let's talk with anyone who has any interest in our music whatever their, you know, politics or economics or whatever it may be. And, and again, that just kind of grew out of like a personal passion and belief for all of us that that was just the fun thing to do and the right thing to do. Um, I, I think most, I should say a lot of grassroots um, artists that I see these days, and, and we'll just say anybody working on a passion project, they really do figure out like what is that differentiating approach that gets us to this one very particular niche that we can super serve, that we can say, you know, we if, if all we need to make is X amount of money to live comfortably for a year, then just divide that by, you know, a thousand people and you say you need 50 people a year to, to put up this amount of money and then you're set. Um, and there's a lot of platforms that make that easier in that world, things like Patreon and whatnot, um, that kind of model of crowdfunding. Um, crowdfunding works to some extent in the nonprofit world, although you guys probably know that better than I do. Um, what are the sort of um, possibilities and drawbacks of that? Um, what you're doing specifically, I'd be really curious to know, like, again, my mind always jumps first to like, what are the other models are out there? Like, what are the most, even if there aren't things that are exactly like it, what are the closest sort of sister projects? Because um, this Google machine is amazing. Like you can actually find that out. And, and when we were starting the music district, you know, one of the things we did was in some sense to like super serve the community that was here with that community engagement process. But also we just did a whole lot of Googling and phone calling and like the sort of old school research method of like what are other people doing that's like this and if you pick enough people's brains over time, especially if you have essentially a global marketplace for ideas, you can pretty quickly figure out like how is this going to work, how is it not going to work, what are the case studies that I take to people. One, one of the things that I'm a huge fan of is just like figuring out in your field, in your corner of the world, what is the most effective storytelling platform or what some people would call a pitch or what some people would, there's a bunch of different names for it, but like what is it in my universe that most quickly convinces people? And if you can figure out what that format is, whether it's a pitch deck in entrepreneurial land or whether it's a multimedia video thing that you put together for a couple thousand dollars or whatever it may be. And and what I was thinking of is you can actually very much like grassroots bootstrap this by just doing a lot of good research and either having really good PowerPoint or visual skills or finding someone at your local university who's a design or data visualization expert and saying like, how do I tell a compelling story with this? Because that's what gets people on board. And I think the more you have that in a format, not to get too specific, but, but if you have a PDF or a video or a link, a website, whatever it is, that people can easily pass around to other people to get them excited and that you can copy and paste the same message 58 times. I did this today, but I can't tell you what I did it for, but I, but I copy and pasted a message 58 times to a bunch of different people around the world to sort of like crowdsource input for this big project that we're working on. And I had one link to send them to and it made it so easy because it's like, hey old friend, thought you'd be interested in this, check it out, da da da, any feedback, love you, see you next time or whatever. Um, and uh, it works, like it's, it's actually kind of amazing if you have 
some some kind of story or some kind of nugget of what you're interested in that that gets people the first half of the way, but then you ask them input for the second half of the way, like you'll get a whole lot of input for that second half of the way. You have to put something out there, but you also have to leave room. So it's this kind of like fine balance of when you actually want input from people or, or when you want buy-in from people. There's another great, um, I'll stop rambling after this, but there's another great um, saying in the entrepreneurial world, which is if you want advice, ask for money. If you want money, ask for advice. And it's like amazing how true that is. Like if, if, if you are truly just wanting to get your project funded, you don't need any more ideas, like uh, ask someone's advice. <laughs> don't, have, don't have the first ask be for the pocketbook because it's just an off-putting way for people to be approached. And chances are if they're the kind of person that you're approaching for money, they're also the kind of person that everybody else that they know in their entire lives is approaching for money. And so ask them for ideas because that's what people get more excited to swap. And I think that's great advice. <laughs> I think that's wonderful advice, particularly for our students, because that's what I see. Pe so many people in the LEAP program have a passion project, and they just don't know how to, to get it off the ground. Yeah. I, I hear these incredible ideas about dancing and uh, disaster, you know, coming in and doing dance in disaster uh, areas where the thing, wow, yeah. uh, things like that. Um, that's just one of a, a zillion that I hear. And I think the advice that you gave about, you know, asking for advice and, and connecting with other people and seeing what the need is, and if other people are doing that out there, is is one takeaway that I think is could be really important for yeah, and, and the, the joke sort of part of that saying is like there's no quicker way to just get someone's advice than to ask them for money because they'll just be like, oh, yeah, you should look up so-and-so or this isn't quite my area or whatever. So it, it cuts both ways. Um, I think that you just made me think of two things and now I can only – I really should have eaten dinner before. <laughs> um, well, I would say – I know what they were. So, so one is that you know that's just a that's just a simple saying that I found to be true 200 times in my life in 200 different ways, but I had never known how to sum it up. And I just crossed paths with some really great entrepreneurial folks before I was ever before I would have ever considered myself an entrepreneur. And I think that's one of the most interesting developments of the last few years, and certainly of the last decade is how the nonprofit and mission-driven worlds are learning from entrepreneurship and business and vice versa. Like I think they're both sort of meeting in the middle somewhere, um, which is a promising development to me because I think they, both of those worlds have things to teach people. The other thing that you made me think of was um, even beyond those two worlds, one thing that has served me really well is just understand, like being able to speak different languages, like if you can speak, as an analogy, if you can speak Spanish, French, Mandarin, English, whatever, you're going to have access to a greater range of ideas and creativity and people and networks. Same thing is true if you can speak nonprofit, for-profit, government, foundation, university, these are all different languages, right? And they each take a little bit of time to learn, and I think you don't necessarily have to be really in them for significant amounts of time to understand roughly how they work, to have like a, a working grasp of the language. Um, I think you can actually learn a lot of that from outside or, or just by making friends with people who are in that. So, so the people who have the most, either the most differentiated or the most um, diversified networks or the most diversified experience themselves across fields will ultimately be coming up with those new ways to find funding or a new way to pitch an idea in the right way to the right person at the right time, et cetera, which to me is an argument for going out and just exploring the landscape and not feeling like you have, maybe some people have it dialed in from the time that they're 12 years old. I was never lucky enough to have that. I still don't have that problem. Like I still don't have my uh, life sort of dialed in. And, and as a result, I think it, it keeps me curious about all the different fields 
of endeavor that human beings go through, which keeps you kind of like multilingual, even if you're speaking like really bad, broken university and really bad, broken foundation mm -hmm. and really bad, bro which is all, all I know how to do is like bad, broken languages, but across a few different um, cultures. And that has helped a lot. Couldn't agree more. Yeah? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, here I am running a program of which I, it's a world that I, I didn't necessarily, that I lived in sort of, but I mean, you learn the language, you learn the language, you stay open, you stay open hearted, you stay open minded and you just absorb and you learn to speak the language and it opens doors, it's interesting. Yeah, and, and I think, um, I, I don't want to put this too strongly because I am also a big believer in specialization and an expertise and especially if it's something you love like really going for it. so let me put it this way the other way to approach life successfully that I've seen is the people who like and this is true whether you're an artist or a scientist or an entrepreneur is people who really latch on to something that they absolutely love and they become the world's foremost leading expert in this very obscure category of one discipline, like a subcategory of a subcategory of a subcategory. But they love it so much it doesn't matter. Like they, they just, they would do that no matter how much or little they get paid. And eventually it, it, it pays off somehow and usually in ways that you don't expect. And I think the same is true. So this is basically just the argument for specialists versus generalists. And I think you need both specialists and generalists pretty much in any scenario that you ever have. I think what I think what gets tricky is you, a lot of us, myself included, get um, trapped in this kind of in-between land where we're not really passionate or great at one thing, but we're also not really exploring or being open or, or and, and so you sort of end up doing a lot of stuff that you think you have to do or that the system says you have to do and you get um, calcified in a system. So if you, if you stay in one place for too long, um, that's the only language you can speak. And if it's not a language that you love, then you're like, that's like the, the worst of both worlds, I think. And I, maybe that's the most economically successful way to live a life. I don't know. I've never been there. And I think some people make it, make it work, but... Um, you know, to me, time is precious, and, and I, I think you, you want to maybe, I don't know, I'll just leave it at that. People can draw their own conclusions from <laughs> that. But, but I have seen people get calcified in institutions where they're really good at that thing, and maybe, like, they're the boss of something or whatever the title is, but they don't really love it. They just got into it because it was an easy place to advance or whatever it was. And as a result, they're stuck there because they've been there for so long that they can't, they're psychologically terrified of making any kind of lateral, let alone downward movement to some other field or some yeah. other endeavor. What do you think? It's all true. <laughs> <laughs> I agree wholeheartedly. <laughs> Go on. What does that What does that make you think of in economics? Or in the, I'm tired of hearing myself talk, um, so I'm going to phone a friend here again. I would. Well, I think it's true to find your niche, and no matter how obscure it is, what you like, drive it home. And that was a little bit with Music Cities. You know, here I am opening up for a band from Omaha, just starting my graduate program, and I'm like, so what's going on in Omaha? And they tell me about this record label that was indie that made so much money they could put a $10 million building downtown. I was like, surely that's what I'm going to study for the rest of my life. And the, the one thing that you know I learned from academia is I actually, um, there was a guy, I can't remember his name, a professor at UT that studied the internet and geography way before it was a thing. And he couldn't find a job. And just no one took them seriously. And it was really kind of the same thing with Music Studies when it first came out. That was only 2011, somewhere around there. People didn't take it seriously. But, you know, if you kept on that course, no matter what it is, eventually it will pay off if you believe in the subject. Um, but yeah. on the flip side of that, in academia, without a doubt, you see people that get, they don't then grow. They become calcified because it's, or, or actually any huge organization. You yeah. Know, you, you know, I saw it in private industry as well. You, you 
do, if you don't grow at any degree, you see people become bitter. And, and also the thought process sort of stops, the creativity drives up and that there aren't new things coming out. You're not fostering new students or junior executives to kind of explore. Yeah, that, Michael, I'm glad I phoned a friend because that made me think of like the next part of that narrative that I didn't say, which is that the specialization, specialization is something you really, really love. Not only does it at some point possibly become super relevant to the rest of the world, but also it opens back up into a general understanding in a way that's really hard to predict. So the, I, I'm thinking of, um, and I'm again, I'm low on blood sugar, so I'm going to botch the story, but E.O. Wilson, who's this famous um, entomologist turned environmentalist turned evolutionary theorist, just like a, a, like a great all-time thinker in science, was obsessed with ants. Like all he cared about was ants. And everybody was like, who's this nerd over here studying ants for decades? Like trying to understand everything there was to know about ants in a time when like there, nobody saw like a practical application of that or whatever. And sure enough, like that extreme specialization of knowledge opened back up later in his life. And all of a sudden he was kind of this expert in evolution and complex systems thinking. And because he'd studied this one thing that became relevant in a way that people just couldn't have predicted. So it was, it's not just that it became relevant for his field, it's that it became relevant for a much bigger audience and a much bigger realm of human endeavor in the same way that you're, the Music Cities thing that you're talking about is a similar similar phenomenon. Yep. So, um, gosh, I hope this is recording. <laughs> this is really good. Um, I'm, you're, you brought up generalists and specialists and, and you know, I'm, I'm a flutist. This is, I'm a classical flutist and I, now I'm running a arts management program, and so I have my own parallels to, that I won't bring in. But I do think this idea of generalists and specialists for the students is really interesting to talk about because you might have this one specialized thing that you do, and it's very hard for you to maybe see later on where that's going to blossom. It might be you study ants for a long time. I remember seeing this story actually. Mm -hmm. and, it's really I think interesting. I messed up some of the No, details, I think you got it right. But the, but the principle, is, the principle yeah. is, is correct. But then you become it maybe a generalist, or you, these skill sets lead you down the path. And I think we started the conversation with, like, what's your story? And, mm -hmm. and how that, that takes you to teams, and how you work within the team, and how those teams change, and how your passion project, you know, arrives or doesn't arrive. And I, I guess I'm... I talk about this so much with my students, but there's a you have to have kind of trust in the system and trust yourself that you know you, this is where you are today. You're studying the clarinet and you're you know you're you're hanging out with Mozart, but then you know there's a shift or you have this really interesting transferable skill or a soft skill or a hard skill that leads you over here and and everything kind of pulls together and so I'm just talking in giant general terms but this is what the students maybe need to hear is all these things we're talking about um, you have these things you just trust us that you're doing the right work and it will lead you down these paths and and if you take all these amazing words of wisdom from Jesse and phone a friend over here um, <laughs> I think you know you will find your way uh, in ways that you couldn't even imagine today sitting in a policy class, you know? Yeah, let me just add like two other um, nuances to that. Um, one is that, I mean, we've all kind of touched on this a little bit, but one is that it's just impossible to predict mm -hmm. what the skills of the future, quote unquote, mm -hmm. right. actually are. I, I actually was just hanging out with my uncle who was visiting here He's kind of a Silicon Valley guy. I don't really know what he does, to be honest, but super interesting, like California weirdo, and he hangs out with all of these big like science and tech and engineering people, and we were talking about STEM and STEAM and the arts and education systems in general, and he's, he's telling me how all of these multi-million, multi-billion dollar companies now are trying to figure out how to reverse engineer sort of artistic, creative problem solving. And so they're bringing in schmucks like me who have spent their whole lives not learning 
science and technology, although I have a massive respect for science and technology, I think they're all part of the same artistic human endeavor, but um, to try and figure out how to get some of those skills back into an education system, back into people whose education system took them out early on. Um, so that's one thing is, you know, things go in and out of fashion. It's hard to figure out what is, so that's just another argument for following your passions. Uh, because the other point, I was having this great conversation with our friend uh, Gigi Johnson, who's a professor at um, UCLA around musical innovation, and we were talking about how uh, this this concept, which I think is completely true, that people narrate their lives backwards. So you're able to put rational, logical thought into your path only once you've already experienced it. And we think that we can narrate our lives forward. <laughs> yeah. We think that we can be like, I'll do this, and then I'll do that, and then this landmark will occur, and then this benchmark, and then I'll get this, and da da, da. And rarely does it turn out that way. If it does, and you're happy with that, Godspeed. <laughs> I'm jealous. Everybody else is too. I think, But I think there's very few people who actually can even have the ability to narrate their lives forward, um, even some of the people who seem most groundbreaking or innovative or whatever you want to call it, chances are that's usually the story that they put together for their TED Talk once they became mm -hmm. hugely successful yeah. and famous and not what the story actually would have been if they had to guess 20 years yeah. before it happened. That's exactly how I wanted to say that, by the way. That's brilliant. Okay. Narrate your life Narrate your life backwards rather than forwards. Yeah. It, or, or just or, know, or know that, that, know that you know can't that really that's narrate right. it forward. And you have to, that's why you have yeah. to like enjoy yeah. whatever path you're on, on because it's ride. only going to make sense looking yeah. back. Yeah. I mean, it's not quite seven, but I feel like that's a good that place. <laughs> I kind of like it. What do you all think? Zach, any <laughs> other? We, you're, the, you're the star <laughs> of the show here. Okay. Well, if you hung in there, we're glad you did, and uh, maybe we'll bring you back another time. Anytime. But I think next time we won't sit under these lights. We'll go somewhere like a little <laughs> bit more relaxing <laughs> with coffee in hand or, totally, or totally. beer culture at Fort Collins. So thank you, Jesse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome to have you here. Thank you. He's Appreciate a good friend of our program. Yeah. Okay. We're going to sign off. Thanks, everybody.